Hi, thank you for joining me today. We've been reading through A Course in Miracles, the chapters, the main text, and uh, we're going to start today in chapter 14, section six. And I do wanna just speak for a moment to the um, gap uh, in time between the last reading and today. So it looks like I should have, if I were reading every Sunday consistently uh, from the main text, this would have been read on March 22nd uh, and 2020 for people listening in the future. So uh, that's about when the world, uh, our world here, my world, uh, became involved in COVID-19 interventions. It's taken me a little while to get back on track. So I apologize for the break. I did want to explain it. The other part of this that I, I want to just be real upfront with you about is that uh, I'm not enjoying the experience of reading this material. It's very difficult material to read. Uh, and uh, as a writer and an editor uh, and someone who really cares about the words we use and the energy in the words, um, this is a very difficult exercise for me. And I am going to I'm going to persist and carry on. And I do hope that I will end up reading the entire uh, main text for you. Um, I don't know, probably don't need to say anything more than that. Uh, I'm committed to the project. I, I believe that there is great wisdom in this material. Uh, it's just really not... Uh, not my cup of tea in terms of the way it's worded. So we're, I'm, I'm doing this as an exercise uh, with an intent of completion. But to be perfectly honest, it's very difficult to make myself sit down and do these readings. So just being transparent. So as I said, we are on chapter 14, which is Teaching for Truth. And uh, we are at section six. I'm going to hope to get through all, uh, there's six through 12 sections ahead of us in this chapter. I'm going to hope to get through all of it. Um, and at the same time, I'm not going to read for more than an hour. So if I can't do it in an hour, um, then we'll have to save the rest of it for next Sunday. Section six is the circle of atonement. The only part of your mind that has reality is the part that links you still with God. Would you have all of this transformed into a radiant message of God's love to share with all the lonely ones who have denied him? God makes this possible. Would you deny his yearning to be known? You yearn for him as he for you. This is forever changeless. Accept then the immutable, leave the world of death behind and return quietly to heaven. There is nothing of value here and everything of value there. Listen to the Holy Spirit and to God through him. He speaks of you to you. There is no guilt in you. For God is blessed in his child, as his child is blessed in him. Everyone has a special part to play in the atonement, but the message given to each one is always the same. God's son is guiltless. God's child is guiltless. Each one teaches the message differently and learns it differently. Yet until he teaches it and learns it, he will suffer the pain of dim awareness that his true function remains unfulfilled in him. The burden of guilt is heavy, but God would not have you bound by it. 
His plan for you awakening, for your awakening, is as perfect as yours is fallible. You know not what you do, but he knows is with but he knows is with you. You know not what you do, but he who knows is with you. His gentleness is yours, and all the love you share with God, he holds in trust for you. He would teach you nothing except how to be happy. Blessed Son of a holy blessing, Father, joy is created for you. Who can condemn whom God has blessed? There is nothing in the mind of God that does not share his shining innocence. Creation is the natural extension of perfect purity. Your only calling here is to devote yourself with active willingness to the denial of guilt in all forms. To accuse is not to understand. The happy learners of the atonement become the teachers of the innocence that is the right of all that God created. Deny them not what is their due for you will not withhold it from them alone. The inheritance of God, no, sorry, the inheritance of the kingdom is the right of God's child, given him in his creation. Do not try to steal it from him, or you will ask for guilt and will experience it. Protect his purity from every thought that would steal it away and keep it from his sight. Bring innocence to light in answer to the call of the atonement. Never allow purity to remain hidden, but shine away the heavy veils of guilt within which the Son of God has hidden himself from his own sight. We are all joined in the atonement here, and nothing else can unite us in this world. So will the world of separation slip away and full communion be restored between the Father and the Son. The miracle acknowledges the guiltlessness that must have been denied to produce the need of healing. Do not withhold this glad acknowledgement for hope of happiness and release from suffering of every kind lie in it. Who is there but wishes to be free of pain? He may not yet have learned how to exchange guilt for innocence, nor realize that only this exchange can freedom can freedom from pain be his. Yet those who have failed to learn need teaching, not attack. To attack those who have need of teaching is to fail to learn from them. Teachers of innocence, each in his own way, have joined together, taking their part in the unified curriculum of the atonement. There is no unity of learning goals apart from this. There is no conflict in this curriculum, which, one, which has one aim, however it is taught. Each effort made on its behalf is offered for the single purpose of release from guilt to the eternal glory of God and his creation. And every teaching that points to this points straight to heaven and the peace of God. There is no pain, no trial, no fear that teaching this can prevail, can fail to overcome. The power of God himself supports this teaching and guarantees its limitless results. Join your own efforts to the power that cannot fail and must result in peace. No one can be untouched by teaching such as this. You will not see yourself beyond the power of God if you teach only this. You will not be exempt from the effects of this most holy lesson, which seeks but to restore what is the right of God's creation. From everyone whom you accord release from guilt, you will inevitably learn your, less, your innocence. The circle of atonement has no end, and you will find ever-increasing confidence in your safe inclusion in the circle with everyone you bring within its safety and its perfect peace. Peace, then, be unto everyone who becomes a teacher of peace. For peace is the acknowledgement of perfect purity, 
from which no one is excluded. Within its holy circle is everyone whom God created as his son. Joy is its, un, is its unifying attribute with no one left outside to suffer guilt alone. The power of God draws everyone to its safe embrace of love and union. Stand quietly within this circle and attract all tortured minds to join you in the safety of its peace and holiness. Abide with me, abide with me within it as a teacher of atonement, not of guilt. Blessed are you who teach with me. Our power comes not of us, but of our Father. In guiltlessness we know him as he knows us guiltless. I stand within the circle, calling you to peace. Teach peace with me and stand with me on holy ground. Remember for everyone your father's power that he has given him. Believe not that you cannot teach his perfect peace. Stand not outside, but join with me within. Fail not the only purpose to which my teaching calls you. Restore to God his son as he created him by teaching him his innocence. The crucifixion had no part in the atonement. Only the resurrection became my part in it. That is the symbol of the release from guilt by guiltlessness. Whom you perceive as guilty, you would crucify. Yet you restore guiltlessness to whoever you see as guiltless. Crucifixion is always the ego's aim. It sees everyone as guilty, and by its condemnation it would kill. The Holy Spirit sees only guiltlessness, and in his gentleness he would release from fear and reestablish the reign of love. The power of love is in his gentleness, which is of God, and therefore cannot crucify nor suffer crucifixion. The temple you restore becomes your altar, for it was rebuilt through you, and everything you give to God is yours. Thus he creates, and thus must you restore. Each one you see you place within the holy circle of atonement or leave outside judging him fit for crucifixion or for redemption. If you bring him into the circle of purity, you will rest there with him. If you leave him without, you join him there. Judge not except in quietness, which is not of you. Refuse to accept anyone as without the blessing of atonement and bring him into it by blessing him. Holiness must be shared, for therein lies everything that makes it holy. Come gladly to the holy circle and look out in peace on all who think they are outside. Cast no one out, for here is what he seeks along with you. Come, let us join him in the holy place of peace, which is for all of us, united as one, within the cause of peace. Section 7 of Chapter 14, Teaching for Truth, the Light of Communication. The journey that we undertake together is the exchange of dark for light, of ignorance for understanding. Nothing you understand is fearful. It is only in darkness and in ignorance that you perceive the frightening and shrink away from it to further darkness. And yet it is only the hidden that can terrify, for not what it is, but for its hiddenness. The obscure is frightening because we do not understand its meaning. If you did, it would be clear and you would no longer be in the dark. Nothing has hidden value, for what is hidden cannot be shared, and so its value is unknown. The hidden is kept apart, but value always lies in joint appreciation, 
what is concealed cannot be loved, and so it must be feared. The quiet light in which the Holy Spirit dwells within you is merely perfect openness, in which nothing is hidden, and therefore nothing is fearful. Attack will always yield to love if it is brought to love, not hidden from it. There is no darkness that the light of love will dispel unless it is concealed from love's beneficence. What is kept apart from love cannot share its healing power because it has been separated off and kept in darkness. The sentinels of darkness watch over it carefully, and you who made the guardians of illusion out of nothing are now afraid of them. Would you continue to give imagined power to these strange ideas of safety? They are neither safe nor unsafe. They do not protect, neither do they attack. They do nothing at all, being nothing at all. As guardians of darkness and of ignorance, look to them only for fear, for what they keep obscure is fearful. But let them go, and what was fearful will be so no longer. Without protection of obscurity, only the light of love remains, for only this has meaning and can give live in light. Everything else must disappear. Death yields to life simply because destruction is not true. The light of guiltlessness shines guilt away because when they are brought together, the truth of one must make the falsity of its opposite perfectly clear. Keep not guilt and guiltlessness apart, for your belief that you can have them both is meaningless. All you have done by keeping them apart is lose their meaning by confusing them with each other. And so you do not realize that only one means anything. The other is holy without any sense of any kind. You have regarded the separation as a means for breaking your communication with your father. The Holy Spirit reinterprets it as a means of reestablishing what was not broken but has been made obscure. All things you have use, all things you made have use to him for his most holy purpose. He knows you are not separate from God, but he perceives much in your mind that lets you think you are. All this and nothing else would, be, would he separate from you. The power of decision, which you made in place of the power of creation, he would teach you how to use on your behalf. You who made it to crucify yourself must learn of him how to apply it to the holy cause of restoration. You who speak in dark and devious symbols do not understand the language you have made. It has no meaning, for its purpose is not communication, but rather the disruption of communication. If the purpose of language is communication, how can this tongue mean anything yet? How can this tongue mean anything? Yet even this strange and twisted effort to communicate through not communicating holds enough of love to make it meaningful if its interpreter is not its maker. You who made it are but expressing conflict from which the Holy Spirit would release you leave what you would communicate to him. He will interpret it to you with perfect clarity, for he knows with whom you are in perfect communication. You know not what you say, and so you know not what is said to you, yet your interpreter perceives the meaning in your alien language. He will not attempt to communicate the meaningless, but he will separate out all that has meaning, dropping off the rest and offering you your true communication to those who would communicate as truly with you. You speak two languages at once, and this must lead to unintelligibility. Yet if one means nothing and the other everything, only the one is possible for purposes of communication. 
the other but interferes with it. The Holy Spirit's function is entirely communication. He, therefore, must remove whatever interferes with communication in order to restore it. Therefore, keep no source of interference from his sight, for he will not attack your sentinels. But bring them to him and let his gentleness teach you that in the light they are not fearful and cannot serve to guard the dark doors behind which nothing at all is carefully concealed. We must open all the doors and let the light come streaming through. There are no hidden chambers in God's temples. Its gates are open wide to meet his son. No one can fail to come here. God has called him. If he close not the door himself upon his father's welcome. Chapter 14, Teaching for Truth, Section 8, Sharing Perception with the Holy Spirit. What do you want? Light or darkness? Knowledge or ignorance are yours, but not both. Opposites must be brought together, not kept apart, for their separation is only in your mind, and they are reconciled by union as you are. In union, everything that is not real must disappear, for truth is union. As darkness disappears in light, so ignorance fades away when knowledge dawns. Perception is the medium by which ignorance is brought to knowledge. Yet the perception must be without deceit, for it becomes the messenger of ignorance rather than a helper in the search for truth. The search for truth is but the honest searching out of everything that interferes with truth. Truth is. It can neither be lost, nor sought, nor found. It is there, wherever you are, being within you. Yet it can be recognized or unrecognized, real or false to you. If you hide it, it becomes unreal to you because you hid it and surrounded it with fear. Under each cornerstone of fear on which you have erected your insane system of belief, the truth lies hidden. Yet you cannot know this, for by hiding truth in fear, you see no reason to believe that the more you look at fear, the less you see it, and the clearer it conceals. What it conceals becomes. It is not possible to convince the unknowing that they know. From their source and point of view, it is not true. Yet it is true because God knows it. There are clearly opposite views on what the unknowing are. To God, unknowing is impossible. It is therefore not a point of view at all, but merely a belief in something that does not exist. It is only this belief that the unknowing have, and by it they are wrong about themselves. They have defined themselves as they are not created. Their creation was not a point of view, but rather a certainty. Uncertainty brought to certainty does not retain any conviction of reality. Our emphasis has been bringing, on bringing what is undesirable to the desirable. What you do not want to what you do. You will realize that salvation must come to you this way if you consider it what dissociation is. Dissociation is a distorted process of thinking, whereby two systems of belief, which cannot coexist, are both maintained. If they are brought together, their joint exception, acceptance becomes impossible. But if one is kept in darkness from the other, their separation seems to keep both alive and equal in their reality. Their joining thus becomes the source of fear. For if they meet, acceptance must be withdrawn from one of them. You cannot have them both, for each denies the other. Apart, this fact is lost from sight, for each in a separate place can be endowed with firm belief. 
bring together, and the fact of their complete incompatibility is instantly apparent. One will go because the other is seen in the same place. Light cannot enter darkness when a mind believes in darkness and will not let it go. Truth does not struggle against ignorance and love does not attack fear. What needs no protection does not defend itself. Defense is of your making. God knows it not. The Holy Spirit uses defenses on behalf of truth only because you made them against it. His perception of them, according to his purpose, merely changes them into a call for what you have attacked with them. Defenses, like everything you made, must be gently turned to your own good, translated by the Holy Spirit from means of self-destruction to means of preservation and release. His task is mighty, but the power of God is with him. Therefore, to him it is so easy that it was accomplished the instant it was given him for you. Do not delay in your return to peace by wondering how he can fulfill what God has given him to do. Leave that to him who knows. You are not asked to do mighty tasks yourself. You are merely asked to do the little things he suggests you do, trusting him only to the small extent of believing that if he asks it, you can do it. You will see how easily all that he asks can be accomplished. The Holy Spirit asks of you but this. Bring to him every secret you have locked away from him. Open every door to him and bid him enter the darkness and lighten it away. At your request, he enters gladly. He brings the, dark, the light to darkness if you make the darkness upon, open to him. But what you hide, he cannot look upon. He sees for you, and unless you look with him, he cannot see. The vision of Christ is not for him alone, but for him with you. Bring, therefore, all your dark and secret thoughts to him and look upon them with him. He holds the light and you hold the darkness. They cannot coexist when both of you together look on them. His judgment must prevail, and he will give it to you as you join your perception to his. Joining with him in seeing is the way in which you learn to share with him the interpretation of perception that leads to knowledge. You cannot see alone. Sharing perception with him, whom God has given you, teaches you how to recognize what you see. It is the recognition that nothing you see means anything alone. Seeing with him will show you that all meaning, including yours, comes not from double vision, but from the gentle fusing of everything into one meaning, one emotion, and one purpose. God has one purpose which he shares with you. The single vision which the Holy Spirit offers you will bring this oneness to your mind with clarity and brightness so intense you could not wish for all the world not to accept what God would have you have. Behold your will, accepting it as his, with all his love as yours. All honor to you through him and through him unto God. Chapter 14, Teaching for Truth, Section 9, The Holy Meeting Place. 
In the darkness you have obscured the glory God gave you and the power he bestowed upon his guiltless son. All this lies hidden in every darkened place, shrouded in guilt and in the dark denial of innocence. Behind the dark doors you have closed lies nothing, because nothing can obscure the gift of God. It was the closing of the doors that interferes with recognition of the power of God that shines in you. Banish not power from your mind, but let all that would hide your glory be brought to the judgment of the Holy Spirit, and there undone. Whom he would save for glory is saved for it. He has promised the Father that through him you would be released from littleness to glory. To what he promised God, he is fully, wholly faithful, for he shares with God the promise that was given him to share with you. He shares it still for you. Everything that promises otherwise, great or small, however much or little valued, he will replace with the one promise given unto him to lay upon the altar to your father and his son. No altar stands to God without his son, and nothing brought there that is not equally worthy of both, but will be replaced by gifts wholly acceptable to father and to son. Can you offer guilt to God? You cannot. There, then therefore offer it to his son, for they are not apart, and gifts to one are offered to the other. You know not God, because you know not this, and yet you do know God, and also this. All this is safe within you, where the Holy Spirit shines. He shines not in division, but in the meeting place where God, united with his son, speaks to his son through him. Communication between what cannot be divided cannot cease. The holy meeting place of the unseparated Father and Son lies in the Holy Spirit and in you. All interference in the communication that God calls, that God himself wills with his Son, is quite impossible here. Unbroken and uninterrupted love flows continuously, constantly between the Father and the Son, as both would have it, and so it is. Let your mind wander not through darkened corners away from light's center. You may choose to lead yourself astray, but you can be brought together only by the guide appointed for you. He will surely lead you to where God and his Son await your recognition. They are joined in giving you the gift of oneness, before which all separation vanishes. Unite with what you are. You cannot join with anything except reality. God's glory and his sons belong to you in truth. They have no opposite and nothing else can you bestow upon yourself. There is no substitute for truth, and truth will make this plain to you as you are brought into the place where you must meet the tr with truth. And there you must be led through gentle understanding, which can lead you nowhere else. Where God is, there you are. Such is the truth. Nothing can change the knowledge given you by God into unknowingness. Everything God created knows its creator, for this is how creation is accomplished by the creator and his creations. In the only, in the holy meeting place, are joined the Father and his creations and the creations of his Son with them together. There is one link that joins them all together, holding them in the oneness out of which creation happens. The link with which the Father joins himself to those he gives the power to create can never be dissolved. Heaven itself is union with all of creation and with its one creator and heaven remains the will of God for you. Lay no gifts other than this upon your altars, for nothing can, go, can coexist with it. 
Here, your little offerings are brought together with the gift of God, and only what is worthy of the Father will be accepted by the Son, for whom it is intended. To whom God gives himself, he is given. Your little gifts will vanish on the altar where he has placed his own. Chapter 14, Teaching for Truth, Section 10, The Reflection of Holiness. The atonement does not make holy. You were created holy. It merely brings unholiness to holiness, or what you made to what you are. Bringing illusion to truth, or the ego to God, is the Holy Spirit's only function. Keep not making from your father, for hiding it has cost you knowledge of him and of yourself. The knowledge is safe, but where is your safety apart from it? The making of time is to take the place of timelessness, lay in the decision to not be as you are. Thus truth was made past and the present was dedicated to illusion. And the past, too, was changed and interposed between what always was and now. The past that you remember never was and represents only the denial of what always was. Bringing the ego to God is to but bring error to truth, where it stands corrected because it is the opposite of what it meets. It is undone because the contradiction can no longer stand. How can contradiction stand when it is, its impossible nature is clearly revealed? What disappears in light is not attacked. It merely vanishes because it is not true. Different realities are meaningless, for reality must be one. It cannot change with time or mood or chance. Its changelessness is what makes it real. It cannot be undone. Undoing is for unreality, and this reality will do for you. Merely by, merely by being what it is does truth release you from everything that it is not. The atonement is so gentle you need but whisper to it, and all its power will rush to your assistance and support. You are not frail with God beside you, yet without him you are nothing. The atonement offers you God. The gift that you refused is held by him in you. The Holy Spirit holds it there for you. God has not left his altar, though his worshipers placed other gods upon it. The temple is still holy, for the presence that dwells within it is holiness. In the temple, holiness awaits quietly for the return of them that love it. The presence knows they will return to purity and to grace. The graciousness of God will take them gently in and cover all their sense of pain and loss with immortal assurance of their Father's love. There, fear of death will be replaced with joy of life. For God is life and they abide in life. The presence of holiness lives in everything that lives, for holiness created life and leaves not what it created holy as itself. In this world, you can become a spotless mirror in which the holiness of your creator shines forth from you to all around you. You can reflect heaven here. Yet no reflections of the images of other gods must dim the mirror that would hold God's reflection in it. Earth can reflect heaven or hell, God or the ego. You need but leave the mirror clean and clear of all the images of hidden darkness you have drawn upon it. God will shine upon it of himself. Only the clear reflection of him can be perceived upon it. Reflections are seen in light. In darkness, they are obscure, and their meaning seems to lie only in shifting interpretations rather than in themselves. The reflection of God needs no interpretation. It is clear. 
plane, but the mirror and the message that shines from what the mirror holds out for everyone to see. No one can fail to understand. It is the message that the Holy Spirit is holding to the mirror that is in him. He recognizes it because he has been taught his need for it, but knows not where to look to find it. Let him then see it in you and share it with you. Could you but realize for a single instant the power of healing that the reflection of God shining in you can bring to all the world? You could not wait to make the mirror of your mind clean to receive the image of the holiness that heals the world. The image of holiness that shines in your mind is not obscure and will not change. Its meaning to those who look upon it is not obscure, for everyone perceives it as the same. All bring their different problems to its healing light, and all their problems find but healing there. The response of holiness to any form of error is always the same. There is no contradiction in what holiness calls forth. Its one response is healing without regard for what it's brought to it. Those who have learned to offer only healing because of the reflection of holiness in them are ready at last for heaven. There, holiness is not a reflection, but rather the actual condition of what was but reflected to them here. God is no image, and his creations as part of him hold him in them in truth. They do not merely reflect the truth, for they are the truth. Chapter 14, Teaching for Truth, Section 11, The Equality of Miracles. When no perception stands between God and his creations or between his children and their own, the knowledge of creation must continue forever. The reflections you accept into the mirror of your mind and time, but bring eternity nearer or farther. But eternity itself is beyond all time. Reach out of time and touch it with help of its reflection in you. And you will turn from time to holiness as surely as the reflection of holiness calls everyone to lay all guilt aside. Reflect the peace of heaven here and bring this world to heaven. For the reflection of truth draws everyone to truth, and as they enter into it, they leave all reflections behind. In heaven, reality is shared, but not reflected. By sharing its reflection here, its truth becomes the only perception the Son of God accepts. And thus remembrance of his Father draws on him and he can no longer be satisfied with anything but his own reality. You on earth have no conception of limitlessness, for the world you seem to live in is a world of limits. In this world, it is not true that anything without order of difficulty can occur. The miracle, therefore, has a unique function and is motivated by a unique teacher who brings the laws of another world to this one. The miracle is the one thing you can do that transcends order, being based not on differences but on equality. Miracles are not in competition, and the number of them you can do is limitless. They can be simultaneous and legion. This is not difficult to understand once you conceive of all of them as possible at all. What is more difficult to grasp is the lack of order of difficulty that stamps the miracle as something that must come from elsewhere, not from here. From the world's viewpoint, this is impossible. Perhaps you have been aware of lack of compassion among your thoughts. <clears throat> sorry. Perhaps you have been aware of lack of competition among your thoughts, which, even though they may conflict, can occur together and in great numbers. You may indeed be so used to this that it causes you little surprise. Yet you are also used to classifying some of your thoughts as more important, larger or better, wiser or more productive and valuable than others. This is true of the thoughts that cross the mind of those 
who think they live apart. For some of the reflections of heaven, while others are motivated by ego, which but seems to think. The result is a weaving, changing pattern that never rests and is never still. It shifts unceasingly across the mirror of your mind, and the reflections of heaven last but but a moment and grow dim as darkness blots them out. Where there was light, darkness removes it in an instant, and alternating patterns of light and, light and darkness sweep across your mind. The little sanity that still remains is held together by a sense of order that you establish. Yet the very fact that you can do this and bring any order into chaos shows that you are not an ego and that more than an ego must be in you. For the ego is chaos, and if it were all of you, no order at all would be possible. Yet though the order you impose upon your mind limits the ego, it also limits you. In order, to order is to judge and to arrange by judgment. It will seem difficult for you to learn that you have no basis at all for ordering your thoughts. This lesson the Holy Spirit teaches by giving you the shining examples of miracles to show you that your way of ordering is wrong, but that a better way is offered you. The miracle offers exactly the same response to every call for help. It does not judge the call. It merely recognizes what it is and answers accordingly. It does not consider which call is louder or greater or more important. You may wonder how you, who are still bound to judgment, can be asked to do that which requires no judgment of your own. The answer is very simple. The power of God, and not of you, engenders miracles. The miracle itself is but the witness that you have the power of God in you. That is the reason why the, the miracle gives equal blessing to all who share it, and that is also why everyone shares in it. The power of God is limitless. And being always maximal, it offers everything to every call from anyone. There is no order of difficulty here. A call for help is given help. Only judgment involved or rather the only judgment involved, is the Holy Spirit's one diversion into two categories, one of love and the other the call for love. You cannot safely make this division, for you are much too confused either to recognize love or to believe that everything else is nothing but a call for love. You are too bound to form and not to content. What you consider content is not content at all. It is merely form and nothing else. For you do not respond to what a brother really offers you, but only to the particular perception of his offering by which the ego judges it. The ego is incapable of understanding content and is totally unconcerned with it. To the ego, if the form is acceptable, the content must be. Otherwise, it will attack the form. If you believe you understand something of the dynamics of the ego, let me assure you that you understand nothing of it. For of yourself, you cannot understand it. The study of the ego is not the study of the mind. In fact, the ego enjoys studying itself and thoroughly approves the undertakings of students who would analyze it, thus improving approving its importance. Yet they but study from the, yet they but study from, oh, sorry. Yet they but study form with meaningless content. Their teacher is senseless through careful, though careful to concede this fact, conceal this fact beyond impressive sounding words, but which may lack any consistent sense when they are put together. This is characteristic of the ego's judgments. Separately, they seem to hold, but put them together and the system of thought that arises from joining them is incoherent and utterly chaotic. For form is not enough for meaning, and the underlying lack of content makes a cohesive system impossible. 
Separation, therefore, remains the ego's chosen condition. For no one alone can judge the ego truly. Yet when two or more join together in searching for truth, the ego can no longer defend its lack of content. The fact of union tells them it is not true. It is impossible to remember God is in secret and alone. For remembering him means you are not alone and are willing to remember it. Take no thought for yourself, for no thought you hold is for yourself. If you would, be, if you would remember your father, let the Holy Spirit order your thoughts and give only the answer with which he answers you. Everyone seeks for love as you do, but knows it is not unless he joins with you in seeking it. If you undertake the searching together, you bring with you a light so powerful that what you see is given meaning. The lonely journey fails because it is ex was excluded what it would find. As God communicates to the Holy Spirit in you, so does the Holy Spirit translate his communications through you so you can understand them. God has no secret communications for everything of him is perfectly open and freely accessible to all, being for all. Nothing lives in secret and what you would hide from the Holy Spirit is nothing. Every interpretation you would lay upon a brother is senseless. Let the Holy Spirit show him to you and teach you both love, his love and his call for love. Neither his mind nor yours holds more than those two orders of thought. The miracle is the recognition that this is true. Where there is love, your brother must give it to you because of what it is. But where there is a call for love, you must give it because of what you are. Earlier, I said this course will teach you how to remember what you are, restoring to your inner identity. We have already learned what this identity, that this identity is shared. The miracle becomes the meaning or the means of sharing it. By supplying your identity, wherever it is not recognized, you will recognize it. And God himself, who wills to be with his son forever, will bless each recognition of his son with all the love he holds for him. Nor will the power of all his love be absent from any miracle you offer to his son. How then can there be any order of difficulty among them? I said I was going to keep this to an hour, but we are at the last section, and so I am going to power through and uh, read the last section of chapter 14. Teaching for Truth, the Test of Truth. Yet the essential thing is learning that you do not know. Knowledge is power and all power is of God. You who have tried to keep power for yourself have lost it. You still have the power, but you have interposed so much between it and your awareness of it that you cannot use it. Everything you have taught yourself has made your power more and more obscure to you. You know not what it is nor where. You have made a semblance of power and a show of strength so pitiful it must fail you. For power is not a seeming strength, and truth is beyond semblance of any kind. Yet all that stands between you and the power of God in you is but your learning of the faults and of your attempts to undo the true. Be willing, then, for all of it to be undone, and be glad that you are not bound to it forever. For you have taught yourself how to imprison the Son of God, a lesson so unthinkable that only the insane in deepest sleep could even dream of it. Can God learn how not to be God? 
And can his son, given all power by him, learn to be powerless? What have you taught yourself that you could possibly prefer to keep in place of what you have and what you are? Atonement teaches you how to escape forever from everything that you now have taught yourself in the past by showing you only that you are now. Learning has been accomplished before its effects are manifest. Learning is therefore in the past, but its influence determines the present by giving it whatever meaning it holds for you. Your leaning, your, rather your learning, gives the present no meaning at all. Nothing you have ever learned can help you understand the present or teach you how to undo the past. Your past is what you have taught yourself. Let it all go. Do not attempt to understand any event or anything or anyone in its light, for the darkness in which you try to see can only obscure. Put in no confidence at all in darkness to illuminate your understanding. For if you do, you contradict the light and therefore think you see darkness. Yet darkness cannot be seen, for it is nothing more than a condition in which seeing becomes impossible. This is my note. It's the lack. Darkness is simply a lack of light. It is not a thing of its own. Reading on, you have not yet brought all the darkness you have taught yourself into the light in you. Can hardly judge the truth and value of this course. Let me read that again. You who have not yet brought all of the darkness you have taught yourself into the light in you can hardly judge the truth and value of this course. Yet God did not abandon you. And so you have another lesson sent from him already learned for every child of light by him to whom God gave it. This lesson shines with God's glory, for in it lies his power, which he shares so gladly with his children. Learn of his happiness, which is yours. But to accomplish this, all your dark lessons must be brought willingly to truth and joyously laid down by hands to open to receive not closed to take. Every dark lesson that you bring him who teaches light, he will accept from you because you do not want it. And he will greatly, gladly exchange each one for the bright lesson he has learned for you. Never believe that any lesson you have learned apart from him means anything. You have one test as sure as God by which to recognize if what you learned is true. If you are wholly free of fear of any kind, and if all those who meet or even think of you share in your perfect peace, then you can be sure you have learned God's lesson and not your own. Unless all this is true, there are dark lessons in your mind that hurt and hinder you and everyone around you. The absence of perfect peace means but one thing. You think you do not will for God's son what his father wills for him. Let's read that again. The absence of perfect peace means but one thing. You think you do not will for God's son what his father wills for him. Every dark lesson teaches this in one form or another. And each bright lesson with which the Holy Spirit will replace the dark ones you do not accept teaches you that you will with the Father and the Son. Do not be concerned about how you can learn a lesson so completely different from everything that you have taught yourself. How would you know? Your part is very simple. You need only recognize that everything you learned you do not want. Ask to be taught and do not use your experiences to confirm what you have learned. When your peace is threatened or disturbed in any way, say to yourself, I do not know 
what anything including this means. And so I do not know how to respond to it. And I will not use my own past learning as the light to guide me now. By this refusal to attempt to teach yourself what you do not know, the guide whom God has given you will speak to you. He will take his rightful place in your awareness the instant you abandon it and offer it to him. I spoke earlier of voices. I can't remember if that was in this lesson or another lesson, but basically, yes, there are voices that speak to us. They are our guides. You cannot be your guide to miracles, for it is you who made them necessary. And because you did, the means on which you can depend on miracles has been provided to you. Okay, I want to stop for a second and just clarify something that I think is very confusing. And I, I, I have an understanding of what this means. I don't know if I'm right, but it resonates for me. And so I'm going to share it with you. When, when, when this says, you cannot be your guide to miracles, for it is you who made them necessary, uh, I, I, I disagree with the way it's worded. I don't disagree with the sentiment of it, but I disagree with the way it's worded because I think it's very misleading. We came, you come into form, right? We're, we're spirits in physical form. And we are, as spirits, a function of divinity. We are an aspect of divinity. We are divinity. Each of us is an aspect of God, if you will. Um, so we come into this physical housing that we have. And when we get here, it's a combination, I believe, of both the physical housing and the way the energy uh, on the planet is working that causes us to forget. And it's that forgetfulness that then makes this here necessary. Right? You cannot be the guide to miracles for it was you who made them necessary. Miracles are what, my interpretation, are what connect us back to our divinity. They're the things that remind us that there's something bigger going on here, something much larger that, that can't be explained in, in simple terms. So that's, when this, that's what this is talking about here. And, and so, uh, let's see, yeah, okay. I'm gonna just start the paragraph again and I'll stop again if I feel I need to. You cannot be your guide to miracles for it was you who made them necessary. You didn't do it by choice. This, it's just how it worked. And because you did, the means on which you can depend for miracles has been provided to you. So we discovered that it, it's easy to forget and get disconnected in this physical form. And so miracles are there, were provided as a way to remind us and connect us. God's son can make no needs for his father can make no needs his father will not meet. So you, you can't have a need that isn't going to be fulfilled. Yet he cannot compel his son to turn to him and remain himself. It is impossible that God lose his identity, for if he did, you would lose yours. And being, your, and being yours, he cannot change himself, for your identity is changeless. The miracle acknowledges his changelessness by seeing his son as he always was and not as he would make himself, being you in separation. The miracle brings the effects that only guiltlessness can bring and thus establishes the fact that guiltlessness must be. So because you will be able to have an experience and create miracles, this is what will remind you that you are divinity in form. 
How can you, so firmly bound to guilt and committed so to remain, establish for yourself your guiltlessness? That is impossible, but be sure that you are willing to acknowledge that it is impossible. It is only because you think that you can run some little part or deal with certain aspects of your life alone that the guidance of the Holy Spirit is limited. Thus would you make him undependable and use this fancied unpredictability as an excuse for keeping certain dark lessons from him. And so by limiting the guidance that you would accept, you are unable to depend on miracles to answer all your problems for you. Do you think that the Holy, what the Holy Spirit would give you, he would withhold from you? You have no problems that he cannot solve by offering you a miracle. Miracles are for you, and every fear or pain or trial you have, you have has been undone. He has brought all of them to light, having accepted them instead of you and recognized they never were. There are no dark lessons he has not already lightened for you. The lessons you would teach yourself he has already corrected. They do not exist in his mind at all, for the past binds him not, and therefore binds not you. He does not see time as you do, and each miracle he offers you corrects your use of time and makes it his. He who has freed you from the past would teach you are free of it. He would but have you accept his accomplishments as yours, because he did them for you. And because he did, they are yours. He has made you free of what you made. You can deny him, but you cannot call on him in vain. He always gives his gifts in place of yours. He would establish his bright teaching so firmly in your mind that no dark lesson of guilt can abide in what he has established as holy by his presence. Thank God. He is there and works through you, and all his works are yours. He offers you a miracle with every one you let him do through you. God's Son will always be indivisible. As we are held as one in God, so do we learn as one in him. God's teacher is like to his creator, as is his Son, and through his teacher does God proclaim his oneness, and his sons. Listen in silence and do not raise your voice against him, for he teaches the miracle of oneness, and before his lesson, division disappears. Teach like him here, and you will remember that you have always created like your father. The miracle of creation has never ceased, having the holy stamp of immortality upon it. This is the will of God for all creation, and all creation joins in willing this. Those who remember always that they know nothing and have become willing to learn everything will learn it. But whenever they trust themselves, they will not learn. They have destroyed their motivation for learning by thinking they already know. Think not you understand anything unless until you pass the test of perfect peace. For peace and understanding go together and can never be found alone. Each brings the other with it, for it is the law of God they not be separate. They are cause and effect, each to the order, and so where one is absent, the other cannot be. Only those who recognize they cannot know unless the effects of understanding are with them can really learn at all. For this it must be peace they want and nothing else. Whenever you think you know, peace will depart from you because you have abandoned the teacher of peace. Whenever you fully realize that you do not know, peace will return for you will have invited him to do so by abandoning the ego on behalf of him. Call not upon the ego for anything. It is only this that you need to do. The Holy Spirit will, of himself, fill every mind that so makes room for him.
If you want peace, you must abandon the teacher of attack. The teacher of peace will never abandon you. You can desert him, but he will never reciprocate, for his faith in you is his understanding. It is as firm as his faith in his creator, and he knows that faith in his creator must encompass faith in his creation. In this consistency lies his holiness, which he cannot abandon, for it is not his will to do so. With your perfection, ever in his sight, he gives the gift of peace to everyone who perceives the need for peace and who would have it. Make a way for peace and it will come, for understanding is in you, and from it peace must come. The power of God from which they both arise is yours as surely as it is his. You think you know him not only because alone it is impossible to know him. Yet the mighty works that he will do through you, and you must be convinced you did through him. It is impossible to deny the source of effects so powerful they could not be of you. Leave room for him, and you will find yourself so filled with power that nothing will prevail against your peace. And this will be the test by which you recognize you have understood. It's a very, very powerful chapter. Very powerful. Very powerful sections of this chapter. Uh, So uh, hold in your heart and mind that you're, you want peace. When you see stuff on the news, hold the thought that you want peace. And things will start to change. You will start to see different things. You will start to experience the miracles that are talked about in this chapter. I can guarantee you. You have to let go of judgment. You have to let go of thinking you know how something's supposed to be or that you know what it means. Let it all go and just be. And allow that guide, the voice of that guide to speak to you. Not your ego. It's not coming from here. You're not thinking your way through this. You're experiencing it. So I hope you have a, a enjoyable time with this chapter. Very difficult reading. But the nuggets are there. So they're worth digging for. So I'll hope to see you next Sunday for the next chapter. We'll start with chapter 15. It uh, isn't quite as long as this chapter, but I don't know that we'll be able to do it in one reading. So we'll see. In the meantime, the daily lessons are also available. and You can always text me at 907-351-3003 or message me on Facebook, YouTube, or SoundCloud. Namaste and much love.